I'm Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday Monday Mindset Mindset Podcast, Podcast. where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 117. (laughs) You wouldn't know this, but Terry was doing the actions in the background. (laughs) (laughs) And Terry, you are the one who is in the hot seat today. So what do you have for us? Well, Daisy, as I shared briefly with you before we got started, I was struggling to find an episode of something new that wasn't really hard for me to listen to enough times to be able to present it and then too not too short. And I was just coming up with a blank. And so I thought, Terry, what book or podcast or something are you pretty familiar with that you could talk about without listening to it today? So I decided I would talk about something that I talk about quite frequently in my work with the fasting method. So our listeners who are familiar with the fasting method and listen to any of my videos or come to my meetings will be rather familiar with this. But I think this is a topic that could help a lot of people who are interested in making some changes to their eating behaviors where they might feel compelled to eat certain foods obviously problematic foods, snack foods, sugar, or things that just they know don't do well in their body, but they can't help it. They keep eating it. So it's about a book. And many people, as I talk about it in the community say, oh, I have that book. So many of us have purchased this book and then maybe never read it. So the book is called Never Binge Again. And it's written by a psychologist named Glenn Livingston. And he went through his own health journey and and weight loss journey. And this is one of my favorite books. And I totally get that it is not for everyone, but so many of the people that I have recommended it to and who have gotten into it have really found it to be a game changer for them. I must read it. It's something I've heard you talk about and I'm familiar with going off and finding the book cover to put in your videos, but I haven't actually read it yet. So I, or maybe I can listen to it. So I might have to look into yes. that. <laughs> I listen to it. I think it's a great one to listen to. He is also the narrator, which I always prefer. So the book is about, if you just read the title and you think, oh, it's about binge eating. And that's what I thought when I first looked at it. I thought, well, I don't need to read this. I I don't consider myself someone who struggles with binge eating. I don't need to look at that book. But by definition, Glenn Livingston talks about binging as any time you eat something that is off your food plan. So for example, in the community in which I work, if people are fasting and decide to eat, that's a binge. It's breaking their food plan to have, have food. Or if I say, I'm not going to eat sugar, and then I eat six cookies, that's a binge. Mm -hmm. Or one cookie is a binge. So anytime I'm eating off of my food plan, my intended food plan is called a binge. And the goal of this strategy is really to help us recognize what's leading to the binge and how we can manage it differently. And so often, as a psychologist, I feel like I came into a lot of these things with, we have to go back to a deeper psychological reason behind it. Mm, mm. And I think this book and some other books that are pretty closely linked to it help recognize that you don't necessarily have to dig into deeper psychological reasons why you're struggling to come off of sugar or can't stop eating potato chips or whatever it is. But but there's a way to understand it and start to make some changes that can be very powerful. Yeah, because that feels very daunting, doesn't it? I'm sure, you know, pretty well everything that you do that's problematic is embedded back there somewhere that's in right. something. But sometimes you do wonder what's... Sometimes there's a point to working through it and uncovering it. But a lot of people that feels daunting and not something they want to do. And and then even then, sometimes it's like, well, what's the point? Am I trying to find someone to blame? I th- no, I need to make changes mm-hmm. now. So 
Mm. And sometimes those deeper (laughs) things are not easily uncovered. So you're talking months and months or years Mm. of trying to get there versus doing something right now that can start to change the behavior. You can still work on the insight piece, but having something practical to work on, I think is really important. And also weirdly can make you more open and feel better equipped to actually go and deal with that stuff. I know that's something I found sometimes in the past. That's right. So I am going to condense this down very much. It is, I think, about a three and a half hour book on Audible. So I'm going to do maybe a 15 minute summary of it. But basically, the whole premise of the book is that what really drives us to engage in these foods off our food plan is part of our brain that some people might refer to as primitive brain or lizard brain. It's that lower brain, and you and I have talked about this in other episodes, but it's that lower part of the brain that is our much more ancestral part of our brain, contains the amygdala, and it is that part of the brain that is not very sophisticated. It is what controls the fight or flight or freeze responses. So when you experience something that is threatening in some way or uncomfortable, this is the part of the brain that's going to process that. Now, this part of the brain wants to feel better. It wants you to feel better. And you can imagine most of us listening to this have learned the easiest way to feel better is to eat. Mm. And usually if I really want to feel better quickly, I don't choose something like broccoli. No. (laughs) I choose a highly palatable problematic food or a lot of food to get that response, to get that dopamine response, to calm that part of the brain and then feel better. So in this book, Glenn Livingston, the author, he has framed this image of this lower part of the brain. He refers to that as his pig. And I heard him interviewed about this and he said, I wish I wouldn't have called it that, but that was what he first came up with. Yeah, because I know you've you've talked about it when you've talked in videos about different books that sort of talk around the yeah. same subject and use different concepts to explain it. And you said, you know, that some people don't like this image, yeah. but that's the one that he uses. Some yeah. people actually stop reading the book because they're so offended mm. by the reference to mm. pig. If, you know, if I've struggled with my weight all of my life, I've been called mm. a pig, I've called myself a pig. Mm. It's such a a shame-based term for so many people that his use of it is problematic. But I encourage people if that does, you know, kind of switch it yeah, out. switch it to something mm. that doesn't mm. feel that same way for you, but to take the concept is really important. So the idea and the pig works well in in his language of developing this concept, but he says, so you are feeling uncomfortable, you're hitting up against some discomfort and the pig tells you it wants to eat this problematic food. And he refers to that as pig squeal. Mm. It's loud. It's annoying. It, Mm. you know, you would do anything to make it stop. So what you do is you go eat what it is that the pig is demanding. And one of the reasons I love listening to the book is he kind of imitates the pig is, you know, like, Oh, goody, we're going to eat this now. And it's just kind (laughs) of fun in that way. But if you think about it, This primitive part of your brain gets a response to stimuli that is uncomfortable and wants to resolve it immediately. It doesn't have a very sophisticated way of resolving things. And so one of its go-to things is food and problematic food. The other thing that's interesting about this part of the brain is that part of our brain does not control our voluntary motor skills. So... If I'm talking about that part of my brain wanting relief by me going and getting cookies, it cannot make me walk to the kitchen to get cookies or I live a block from Whole Foods. It cannot make me walk to Whole Foods. This is why the pig squeal is so important because it gets loud and it it tells me things. It tells me deceitful lies to get me to go get the cookies. I have to, in my other part of the brain, have to decide to do what this part is telling me. So one of the most important concepts of this book is the idea that that primitive part of the brain has these urges and 
we have this whole other section of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, that can decide what to do with that. And this part of our brain is rational, problem solving, and even future thinking. Whereas that inner primitive brain, the pig, is not. Mm-hmm. It does not care. Feed me now. That's right. <laughs> That's right. It doesn't care that eating this is going to spike your glucose for the next three days. Mm. All it cares about is it's going to feel good right now. It's going to relieve what I'm feeling right now. It doesn't care that you have um, uh, gastrointestinal problems when you eat this food. Unfortunately, it will still encourage you to eat it. And then it will encourage you to do something then when you experience mm. the consequence. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle in that way. So the idea is that when you hear this pig squeal, you learn to ignore it. You cage the pig. You do not let the pig make decisions for you. It is this other thing trying to make decisions for you. And it's demanding. It's deceitful. Sometimes it'll be really nice to you and it will say, Daisy, you have had such a hard week this week with internet issues. Go ahead. You can have some of this. It's all right. So it's very conniving, mischievous, deceitful messaging that it will give us. But most of us don't recognize it's a separate part of our brain that we can learn to cage and not listen to it and not give in to its demands. Yeah, well, I think so many of us tie those. When you said, just going back a little bit, when you were saying it's a different part of our brain that is the motor function that takes us to the fridge to satisfy the demand Mm -hmm. of that other part. And I think a lot of us think that they're completely meshed together. You know, I I just can't help myself. I go to the fridge without thinking about it. Before I know it, that ice cream is going down. Mm -hmm. It's I can't control myself. So learning to start to separate out. Mm. That impulse is coming from this part of the brain. I have to choose whether to act on it. And it's trying to control this part. Yeah. Right. And to strong arm it, it's got to be manipulative to get you to do what it wants you to do. So if you think about the pig squeal, it's annoying, it's harsh, it's hard to hear. But if you can learn not to listen to it, learn not to give into it, you cage the pig. You don't have to do what it's demanding that you do. Because that's hard. That sounds like willpower. Mm -hmm. Is that willpower or is it something different from that? I don't think it's willpower in this way. That part of your brain wants the good goals that you're working for. So let's say I'm working on weight loss and the pig is telling me, um, eat cookies, eat potato chips, eat whatever, these problematic foods. It's okay. You can start tomorrow. Yeah, we can figure that out on Monday. It's okay. You, You deserve it. You've worked hard. You've earned this. All of these deceitful messages. If I'm listening too closely to that, then that will be willpower. Mm. But the other part of my brain has a very clear sense of what my goal is. Right, it right, has right. values around this health marker or this weight number or whatever the thing I'm working on is important to it. And like I said, it can think about the future. It knows if I eat this right now, that's going to set me back for days. So I see it as being separate from willpower. It's mm-hmm. actually recognizing I just have to not give in to the impulse. I need to hear it as an impulse and realize I'm here in this part of my brain. It doesn't control me. And he talks some about the importance of recognizing it as separate from, as an it, this other part. Well, it's funny. Which which episode was it recently where we were talking about the magic happening in that space? And people obviously can't see you at home, but you make a fist with one hand and that's the the pig part of the brain. And then mm-hmm. you sort of wrap your hand over the other. And as you were talking there, you were 
pulling your hands apart and creating this space in between. And it just made me think of that episode, which I can't remember, where we were talking about the things that happen in that space. You have to create that mm. space. You have to pull those, tease those two parts apart. And that's when we realize that mm. actually we do have control. I was talking about the power in that space between Yes, that that's exactly. where our power yeah, yeah, lies. Yeah. But right now, we don't have any space in between. No. So this is mm. about teaching ourselves to create Breaking some of that, that space. that connection. Mm. And a big section of the book then goes into some more ways about how to do that. Glenn Livingston then goes through some examples of setting up your food plan. And this contains rules about things that you eat, behaviors you do around eating, things you don't eat, behaviors around eating that you don't do. And he breaks them into different categories. I'm doing a really brief overview of it here, but categories of never. So for example, one of mine, I, I don't have a lot of never rules, but my one never rule is I never drink diet soda. Yeah. Crack zero has gone onto the never yep. list. It wasn't on the never yep. list, but it has to be on the That's never right. list because I can't do anything but else. But for me, yeah. this was on the 24 hour a day list <laughs> in, in my past. Yeah. Yeah, so it is now exactly. a never for me. And it's hard to put things on the never list because you don't like to think I'm never going to have that thing again. But. That's right. But lots of people who have overcome addictions have had to mm. do that. And exactly. that's what this soda was for me. It was a, it was running my life. It, mm, same. And then I always use this example with clients, but donuts. I generally eat low carb. Um, I don't generally eat sugar, but every once in a while I will have a donut. So it didn't make it onto my never list, mm. but diet soda did. And people think, oh, mm. definitely diet soda is easier than this. But for me, the diet soda was ever present. It was, you know, 20 of them a day. It was on the nightstand at mm. night. So he does uh, one category of a uh, type of rule people might need to make for themselves is never. I often encourage people, if you're really struggling with that, be really careful. Don't put a bunch of things in the never category to start. See where you want to go with this. Another category is always. So let's say, for example, I always drink water with my meals. Um, I've had a client recently who one of her always was, I always eat greens with every meal. Mm, nice. So that meant she had to have some vegetables with each meal, regardless of what the meal was. So it was mm. an always rule. Then another category of rules would be kind of conditional things sometimes. And this is the one that starts to get kind of blurry for people. And so it's one that I think people really need to spend some time considering. So let's say, for example, I say a rule like, I don't eat dessert except for on my anniversary, on my birthday, and on these three holidays. Meaning I am going to have dessert sometimes, mm -hmm. but it's very clear when. Because if I leave it up to in the moment making that decision, that primitive brain is always going to tell me, oh, it's okay now. This one's okay. This time's all right to do it. So having it very clearly defined. And in his book, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the book in a moment, but he goes through some examples with clients. And I remember this one interview with a woman and she said, well, I, um, I don't want to eat baked goods anymore. I think that's what's really causing me the problem. But I don't want to give up baked goods completely because my husband and I like to go to this special place on Sunday and I like to get a baked good. Well, then I like to get this baked good on Wednesday. So he said, okay, is it twice a week you can have a baked good? Is it once a week? So really getting clear on what's allowed, what's not allowed. Where can you be with this food or this behavior? Yeah, because you can make it as clear as the never category. That's right. That's right. Still is defined. And then the other thing is, as I, I'm giving some examples right now that these are about foods that you eat or don't eat, but also they might be behaviors. So for example, I know many people struggle with eating in their car because they go through a drive through or they went to a gas station or a convenience store or a pharmacy and bought snack foods. They do great when they go to the grocery store and buy their groceries, but these things trip them up. Mm. So instead, one of their rules might be I never buy food at a gas station or a convenience store. Mm. 
Never eat in the car. Never eat in my car. Or I only eat in my car when I am on a long car trip. And then I always encourage people to add this. And then it is only food that fits my food plan. Because you know many of us, I'm sure you and I both have done this, Daisy, we discount any of those rules because of the environment. Well, I can't Mm. help it. I mean, I'm in the car versus no, there's no reason to not still eat the food that fits my food plan when I'm in the car. And to be honest, even that, you could still adhere to that rule because if you were on a long car trip, it would be better for you to stop at a fast food. Mm-hmm. It, you know, most, there aren't many, well, that perhaps there are in the States, drive throughs are just drive throughs but everywhere I know, like a McDonald's or something, has a drive through attached to it. But you can go and sit in the restaurant mm-hmm. or you can go and sit outside. You could sit on the bonnet of your car. It would be a better idea actually if you were on a long car trip to stop and take some time and walk around and you know and get your meal so you could you know you can still apply these rules so i think it's it's people just taking that time to really think about what are the behaviors that Mm, trip me up think about the details and what are the details what parameters need to be put in place Mm. here so these this creating a food plan with your food rules is really important part of it Yeah, I have that rule with chips or with French fries, as you would call them, in that I can have them when I'm out as many times as I go out, which isn't very often. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, if I happen to weirdly eat out three times in one week and all of those times had delicious fries on the menu, I could have them. But that is my rule. Mm -hmm. I can have them when I'm out if I want to, but they do not come in the house. Mm -hmm. And so many times I walk past you know, getting some vegetables and the potatoes and they're, oh, I'm tempted. No, nope, mm-hmm. that's the rule. You can, They're not in the never. Yep. But... They're in the conditional category. Another piece that he talks about that's really important way to nuance some of this is you never change your rule on the spot. Mm. Yeah. So you don't walk into a, you know, or... Yeah, because that's listening to the pig, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Absolutely. Or we could just change it. Just the this pig once. never wants you to follow <laughs> any of these rules. So it is always going to be just telling you today. to work around. <laughs> Absolutely. Mm. So if you are going to change a rule, so let's say I have a rule about dessert and how often I will eat dessert. And this weekend, I'm going to an event that is not in my list of acceptable times. Prior to going, I can decide, you know what? While I'm at this event, I am going to have a dessert. I'm going to have one. I'm not going to have two, but I am going to have a dessert if I decide I want one versus waiting until you get there, Mm. seeing the dessert and saying, that's okay. I'm just going to change my rule because that gets us into very slippery slope area there. So yeah, I can see that there's a big difference. mm -hmm. One of the really powerful things about this whole plan is that You don't do that behavior or you don't have that food or whatever it is right now. You don't have to decide what you're going to do tomorrow. You have to decide for right now because that's my rule. I'm in my car. I don't eat my car. I don't have to do it right now. And it helps you not get overwhelmed by all of the other decisions you're going to have to make. You just stick with right now. So I like to use this other image for me when I think about this book. And I think... Rather than the pig, I use this language. And anyone who has watched Star Wars will know who I'm talking about, but you may even know it better than I do because it was a long time ago for me. But Jabba the Hutt. The way I picture Jabba the Hutt, very kind of large, slob-like, gnarly, can't really do things for itself, but has kind of... I don't even know if they're sex slaves or something, but minions or someone else getting things for them. That's what that part of the brain is doing for me. It's sitting there saying, oh, bring me this, bring me a muffin. Oh, that's clever. Can't actually do it itself. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. But gets what it wants because it's mm. threatening. And it, it, I think in one of the movies, like it just picked up a person and ate them or something. Like <laughs> it's, it, You don't mess with Jabba the Hutt. So Jabba the Hutt has a lot of power. Now, again, a great Star Wars fan is going to be able to tell me the full storyline of Jabba the Hutt and everything. But 
This is just the image that I have. So for me, I use that. This part of my brain is gluttonous and wants what it wants right now to feel better and it will do anything to get me to do it. And I have to learn not to give in to the power of Jabba. (laughs) Now, after you listen to the book, I have listened to this book at least three or four times. I feel like every time I listen to it, I pick up some more things, I more details, more nuances of pieces. So I definitely would encourage if you've listened to it or read it, keep going, do it again. Then in the audible version, there is a section called after credits. And oftentimes these are the parts of audible books that I never even pull open, you know, it's handouts or it's things like that. But in this, the after credits, seven and a half hours of after credits. No way. Are segments of interviews, transcripts of Glenn Livingston talking with a client in applying this after they've already learned the never binge again concepts. Now they're putting them into place and reviewing them. So you get to hear what it sounds like in action with real examples. Hmm. So when I go for a walk, I'll put on my headphones and I'll listen to a couple episodes of that. Mm. So it just makes it so fresh in my mind, makes it real for me and helps me apply it. You know, well, how does that fit for me? How, what rules do I need? Now in the book, they do go through some of the rule building skills and things There is also a workbook. So if people are serious about using this concept, there are tools that can help you to create your food plan, um, help you work on recognizing that voice versus your, you know, rational down to earth voice and learn to use it. I just think I've listened to so many clients in our community start to use this language and applying it in ways that really helps them stop certain problematic behaviors or choose how they use them when and where and when they don't so that they feel much healthier in that approach. And then, as I said previously, there are some other books that I would say are fairly similar in that they come from a similar background from a starting point Mm. that is a separate book that maybe we'll talk about one day. But I think this one can be a game changer for so many of us. Well, I think it's about time that I listen to it. So I think I have a credit lurking on Audible. So I am going to spend it on this. And that's that's very interesting about (laughs) the extra. It sounds like twice the length of the book Mm -hmm. uh, after credits. But I think that's so often where people find the greatest value is hearing Mm -hmm. other people like them stories Mm -hmm. you know because it's all these theories sound really interesting but how do I apply them in my Mm -hmm. life and when you hear other people who because some of them are bound to be similar to you or to be similar Mm -hmm. enough to make sense to you it just makes it it just starts cementing in it and making it all make sense to you and, mm. and for you to suddenly see how you can apply it to your own life. So that that sounds great. I'm going to go order it. There's also a podcast with similar kind of transcripts that you can listen to. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Daisy, I was thinking of an example in one of the episodes that I just had a client recently address this in her own experience with the book and thinking of this way. Many of us might say, I can't never have this again. I couldn't do that. That's Mm. too hard. That's something I can't commit to that. I'm unable to do that. And she stopped and she said, wait a minute. There are a lot of things in my life that I made a commitment to never do. Now she happens to be someone who quit smoking. So that's a hard, Mm. you know, Mm. black and white line. She never smokes a cigarette. Mm. So she realized, wait a minute, I can do this. And she said, you know, she's raised kids. And she said, I chose to never hit my kids. That was a conscious, I never do this behavior Mm. that I lived with and honored. Why can't I do that with some of these food behaviors? Mm. So recognizing we do these things in other areas of our lives and then applying it to this. Mm. 
Well, Daisy, I'm really excited to hear that you want to listen to this book. I think you'll enjoy it. And I look forward to chatting with you about it again sometime after you've gone through it. And I invite all of our listeners to check it out if you've not already done so. And if you have and you found it useful, see what a second time through it does for you. I, like I said, I've uncovered more each time. So I hope everyone has a great week and I look forward to seeing everyone soon. We'll see you next time. Bye, Daisy. Bye.